Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Mysterious Galaxy virtual event. I'm Nick, the director of events here for the store. Today, I have two wonderful authors with you. We have, of course, Rudy Louise and Jen Given. Hello. Hi, Nick. Hi. How are you doing? Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Of course. Uh, for those you may not know, Rudy it was raised around ranches and horses, reared on tales of the Old West and the Mexican Revolution but then moved to Harvard and success as an award-winning author of literary fiction. Now he brings his brand of posh storytelling, cultural immersion, and magical realism to create his latest work, I have to show it off, Valley of Shadows, which is the book we are celebrating. Um, and a, I have to say this, a Western, Southern Gothic, and a horror tale, all wrapped in one. Love it. <laughs> Thank Jen you. is going to be celebrating next week the release of her latest novel, River Woman, River Demon. Now, Jen is a Mexican-American, an indigenous poet, novelist, and transformational coach from the southwestern desert and the recipient of poetry fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, Penn Rosenthal, Emerging Voices, and like I said, R River Woman, River Demon will be coming next week and we'll be having an in-store event and virtual, it's a hybrid, uh, for her release date on October the 4th. So if any of you want to purchase any of uh, Rudy's books, including his latest Valley of Shadows or and or pre-order uh, Jen's latest novel, you'll see there's a link below that says buy Valley of Shadows and get signed book plate. They'll actually take you to our web page for the event where you can purchase and pre-order any of those books I mentioned. If you purchase Valley of Shadows, you do get a signed book plate from Rudy. And if you have any questions that you want to ask, it looks like someone has already found that. There's a button below that says ask a question. And you can submit any of your questions that you want to ask later in the program of either Rudy or Jen. All right. I think I've done enough talking. I'm going to disappear for now, but I'll be back at the end. So I can leave it these two to take it away. Thank you, Nick and Jennifer. Thank you so much for being here with me um, to celebrate both our books coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. And I loved your book. I loved, even though it was terrifying and kept me up <laughs> uh, <laughs> late at night while I was reading it, both engrossed with it and also because I was scared. <laughs> you know, and it's funny because people say that about my books, um, but I never think mine are as scary as they are. Did you like set out to write a horror when you started? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, that was very different for me. Um, I love writing in the magical realism style and, um, but I, you know, had not really gone into like applying it to a genre. And in this, in this novel, it's both horror, well, it's kind of horror and mystery and Western uh, that, that I applied it to. And it was a lot of fun. I, I felt very kind of, in a way, you think that that extra structure would make it harder, but actually found it very helpful and uh and the horror part was tough though it's kind of tough you know it was something new for me to write um and sometimes like after i would write some of these kind of difficult scenes um i don't know i just felt like i really needed a palate cleanser you know like it kind of <laughs> kind of stuck to me and it found myself found myself kind of in like a, a down mood because it's just mm -hmm. not it's just not something i was accustomed to writing is that something like you've you kind of felt because there was a lot of in your in your new novel, uh, River Woman, River Demon. It's like there's also a lot of hard emotional stuff that it involves, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it kind of kind of uh, I mean, some tragedy and like in some 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 stuff that if you were to experience it in real life, like I could imagine it'd be very traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there are a few things that I'm a mom. I have two kids. I know you have kids as well. And there are a few things that I feel like are off limits for me to write about right now, you know, with my kids at certain ages. And so like, um, you know, I'm working on a new book now and originally uh, something was gonna happen to a girl that was the same age as my daughter. And, I, and like after a few weeks of wrestling with myself, I was like, nope, change a plot, just can't do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I feel like there, there are some things that psychically and emotionally, I just, won't touch but then i feel like everything else that came from my own personal life my own experience and especially my past experiences in girlhood and and early adulthood um once i write them onto the page i can get as horrific as i need to because i feel like there is such a psychic release 
with that. You know, I've mm. given it to my protagonist. I've given it to my characters. It's no longer mine. Um, and then I'm able to fictionalize it and build this world around it. And it, and so for me, I, I don't feel like um, I'm not scared of it. And so I'm actually surprised when people tell me, you know, it's a horror. It kept me up at night or when someone says like, it's like Stephen King. And I'm like, wow, because <laughs> it, I, I guess because it's such a release for me, you know, do you, so do you feel that way? Like, is there, is there any of transmuting your own life or experiences? Like tell, cause you grew up on a ranch, right? So what was that like, like to transmute your own experiences onto the page book to fictionalize it in this world, especially in the past? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, a lot like kind of how you describe it. I mean, with with the horror part, you know, fortunately, I had no personal experiences that were that horrific. Uh, but yeah, it was good. really, uh, you know, as like, both of our books, one thing I, I like about uh, that, that we shared in common when I was surprised, like how much how there were some common themes, you know, when I read your book and and um, mm -hmm. that we both kind of drew, I feel like we both drew inspiration from some kind of ancestral legends or myths um, that, mm -hmm. that tied in into the plot and sort of into the magical part of our stories. Um, and so for me, that was really a source of in inspiration, like researching and studying. Um, you know, you may remember from when you read the book, um, you know, kind of studying sort of the Aztec rituals that end up uh, being a part of the story in Valley mm -hmm. of Shadows. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of helped me, it, it kind of helped me sort of, you know, come up with these scenes that were indeed, you know, uh, horror scenes. Uh, but luckily, I didn't have to draw too much on my personal experience. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so I could kind of have fun with it. But, you yeah. know, it was a little bit detached from my personal life. So that was so that was good. And the parts that are personal, like living on the border and the sort of the multicultural, bicultural experience, my national experience, mm. I think that stuff just comes very naturally to me because, yes, I did grow up, you know, um, on the U.S. Uh, Mexico border. So so that is I do draw a lot of inspiration just from my real life in that in that sense. You said that it was part Western, part um, Gothic and part horror. Right. Is that are those kind of the three genres that you drew from? Are there any others in there? Yeah, I mean, I think I think mystery, you know, yeah. as well. I think it's yeah. almost I mean, it's kind of a blend of balance and the mystery and horror side. And then on the Western part, you know, I really I I, I really drew inspiration from the Westerns. But I, I grew up watching like the Western movies, you know, because my dad was a fan. Um, but also, luckily, my dad was a fan of the Mexican, like, charro movies of, like, mm. back in the 1950s, where you had those singing Mexican charros that were mm -hmm. kind of also gunslingers and everything. So so what I thought, you know, being Mexican-American, I just always thought, wouldn't it be cool to see in a Western, in a, an American Western, uh, a situation where the heroes and heroines were Mexican, Mexican-American, Native American, uh, rather than just the classic you know, John Wayne um, mm -hmm. type of type of hero. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like it tied a lot with like the social justice sort of issues I wanted to explore as well, uh, which I know is something uh, I also saw a theme in common in your book that we were mm -hmm. both kind of interested in how could we weave these social justice topics and issues into the story in a very natural way. Um, for me, it was this idea in Valley of Shadows of having this this Mexican former Mexican lawman who used to be the sheriff of, of his town on the border, uh, this town called Olvido, and it was in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, but then the Rio Grande shifts course and mm -hmm. Olvido ends up stranded sort of on the northern U.S. side of the border. And our character, our hero, Solitario uh, Cisneros, he loses his badge. Uh, he loses a lot more than his badge. He loses his country and as as you learn pretty quickly in the story, he's lost everything he loves, everyone he loves, right. uh, including his beloved, his beloved mm -hmm. wife. So he's mm -hmm. very lonely. He's, he's a recluse. He's hiding from the world. Um, and, uh, and so he's kind of, he, he's that, he's that hero that uh, when this horrific series of crimes starts happening in Olvido, the town leaders are, are trying to lure him out to help them um, stop these killings and save, rescue these children that have been, that have been kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah. And I was noticing too how Solitario and Olvido, like the names are important. They're in Spanish and 
olvido, forgetting, right? Or for, forgotten or forgetting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then solitario would be like alone or solitary. Was there another meaning that you had intended as well? No, no, absolutely that. It was very symbolic, you know, of of his. Uh, the name just sort of came to me as, as they sometimes do the characters, you know. Uh -huh. But it really, I felt like it embodied his personality, and uh -huh. also like one of his biggest challenges as a character, which was how to um, come out uh, of his shell of of you know isolation and grief, uh, and really fear of engaging with the world because he's haunted by this mystical curse. Uh, and anyone who he loves um, seems to perish. And um, so he um, he is very much solitary, uh, but as he's placed into this, this dilemma of does he stay in hiding and protect himself or does he help the village, the villagers, um, and uh, I don't want to ruin the story, but you know, oh, yeah, I, don't, I was like, don't give away too much. <laughs> there, wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a book if he doesn't step up to the plate, right? Um, so he has to overcome the, the fact that the very fact that he is this solitary, isolated person that's embodied by his name, he has to kind of overcome that part of himself in order to re engage with the world and have a chance at, at life again, yep, and so. And just in terms of the names, I was thinking too, as with magical realism, there's a sense of allegory to the story as well. And so that it embodies a kind of like the thematic elements are just woven naturally in through the magical realism. And I was kind of wondering, do you have, when you write a story like this, did you have a kind of a message first that you wanted to convey? Or was it the, like more story elements like plot that came first or how did those weave together so that the magical realism and the plot right and then the deeper social justice meaning like how does that come to you how does that process work yeah that's a good question you know i mean sometimes it seems like uh you know the idea for a plot like kind of might come to me first or the idea of a character, you know, might come to me first. In this case, it was more the the concept of of writing this particular type of story uh, came to me first. And it was I, I kind of owe it to my son, who um, mm -hmm. you know he's a, he's an eighteen year old now, but a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, um, he's always been just a very good uh, supporter and like always reads my short stories and so forth. So. He had told me one day, hey, dad, have you ever thought about writing a, a Western horror story? And I was oh, like, wow. Wow, well, that, yeah, that sounds like a real challenge. I've never written, I, you know, a Western or a horror story. <laughs> so either he, you know, either he's he's telling me my, my old writing was boring or he just wanted something really <laughs> It was not boring. <laughs> <laughs> I read your first book. You're, it was not boring. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I think thank he just knew much. you were up for the challenge. I think he yeah, knew that I, you could do it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it was a fun challenge, you know, and I thought, you know how it is when your kids ask you to do something, it's really hard right. to say no, right? <laughs> right. That's <laughs> so awesome. It a, yeah, it's a really good challenge. And when you presented it to me, I thought, you know, this could be a lot of fun, if, especially if I could weave in the magical realism and, 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 and weave in that idea of the social justice issues. And, and what kind of um, I started to build around was, was the idea of having um, this Mexican American, um, you know, lawman be the hero, and his Native American uh, ally and partner, a uh, character named uh, Onawa, who uh, is a seer and can kind of uh, do some very fascinating things with her own, you know, magic and spirituality. In, right. in a way, she's much more talented than Solitario is. Solitario, right. <laughs> Solitario can speak to dead people, which is like a really good talent if you're an investigator. Right. Uh, you know, I thought, wouldn't that be a detective's dream, right? Um, right. But, but Onawa is also like just supremely talented uh, and kind of comes to his rescue. And I wanted to see that too. You know, in the old Westerns, you always see the cowboy man, you know, saving the damsel in distress. Right. And I kind of wanted to flip it. And I wanted to see him constantly be saved by Onawa and realize that, you know, she should really be probably the sheriff, not, not him. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love structure. that. I love that he knew that he needed her, right? And he goes and, and he really has to convince her to be on his side. Well, not convince her, more, I was gonna say more convince her father too. And I wanted to ask you, 
um, just in terms of some of the the story elements that you're giving homage to, how do you modernize them and also, you know, flip the script so that you're subverting some of like some of the things in the past that might have been racist or bigoted toward Mexicans or toward indigenous people, right? And so how do you flip the script so that you put them front and center? Like just where did you ever find yourself like pushing back against stereotypes and really, you know, doing that in a pointed way in your work? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, I was really interested in, because of the social justice aspects that I wanted to explore. And as I was as I was writing this uh, manuscript, um, it was during the pandemic and there, the social justice um, was in front and center in the media with the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I just thought that, that it was it was a great opportunity to address that. And I one of the questions that fascinated me was um, the idea of kind of imagine how different history, you know, might have been if people yeah. of color had been in positions of authority and power to be able to influence the course of that history. Um, yeah. And so that's why I wanted to, to explore this. And I, I did kind of push against stereotypes, I think, um, in a variety of ways, you know, one of one of one of the things and I also wanted to push against this sort of history itself. Um, there was yeah. one particular event that occurred uh, that I that I learned about in the process of doing the research for the novel that is uh, known as the Porvenir Massacre of 1918. It was um, it's an event not a lot of people know about, um, but uh, basically in 1918, there were 15, it was in a small town of uh, Porvenir, Texas. So it kind of similar place like Olvido, just a small border town and 15 Mexican and Mexican American boys and men were um, accused of stealing cattle in this town. There was no evidence uh, against them, um, but the Texas Rangers and the US Cavalry rode into town rounded up the 15 you know boys and men uh, there was no trial there was no due diligence they executed them in front of their families um and then their families all fled in terror to mexico you know across the across the border um and then the event was swept under the rug of history uh for about 100 years it took 100 years for the state of texas to acknowledge that this had happened uh and for a historical marker wow. or monument to be put up. So I kind of took, I wanted to sort of t pay homage to a little, a little bit of homage to that and took some mm -hmm. inspiration from that and, and tried to imagine hey, what if there had been someone who could do something about that in that time and like save these people's lives, you know, and kind of right the wrongs of history, if you will. And so that's, yeah. that's one of the scenes in that, that um, is, uh, is in the book that if we do read a little bit from our books, uh, you know, I, I can share a scene that was sort of inspired by that. Yeah, I'd love that. I think we'll have time. Um, yeah, was that, were there any other questions that you had wanted to ask, I mean, to answer or to talk about? Well, you know, I mean, I, I was really curious um, to chat with you as well, because I have questions since I read your book and absolutely loved it as well. Um, I, I, you know, thank you for the for the honor of getting to read it you know before before it comes out so that was that was also really cool um i i, I love the you know narrator uh eva uh mm -hmm. i don't know if you pronounce it eva or eva i i tend to go with eva because yeah interchangeably <laughs> and in the book too like for instance she has her her children that are her exes she calls them because they're both both of their names start with an x and so there's javier and jimena but like in my in my head, I interchangeably it's Xavier and Jimena or Javier and Jimena, and then Eva. It's either Eva or Eva, and either way. So, yeah, however you so, pronounce it, that's so <laughs> that's authentically the English. bicultural. Yeah, it's so authentic. Exactly, because I, I grew up being Rudy, Rudy, and Rodolfo. So you know, exactly. I'm familiar. <laughs> I love I'm it. Familiar with all that. Well, so I love this character, and I was just curious. What inspired you? One of the aspects of it, I hope I'm not giving too much away, but I love the the device of the unreliable narrator and mm -hmm. the fact that she kind of has a, a lot of doubt about her own actions and memories and things. And 
I was just curious. I mean, it seems like it'd be challenging to write from that point of view. And, and I was just curious what inspired you um, to go that route because I loved it and I'm kind of, you're inspiring me to try that someday, but I was curious how difficult it was and what led you down that path. You absolutely should. It was a fun challenge. And, you know, part of it too is that I feel like every agent, every editor has told me, don't write in first person. And I, that, that like, when you tell me not to do something, I guess there's just the churlish teenager rebellious nature still in me. And I was, well, I'm going, you know, I, I have to do it. Of course I have to try. Right. And also I'm, I'm a poet first and foremost. I mean, I, I have stories in me and I love writing novels, but I wrote poems first and mm -hmm. in poems, I have the often the first person speaker. And so in trying to tap into this character's voice, I felt like something unlocked when I realized that I needed to speak through her voice as if I were writing just a long poem. And so that's what the novel felt like to me, at least on the first draft, it was, it was uh, much more in her head. I felt like I just needed to get to know her. And then I brought in quite a few more story elements on other drafts. And so um, it was really just getting her voice right. And it was a great exercise, you know, just for fun. But the major, like thematic elements that were important to me in the unreliable narrator are that when I was first uh, mothering my children, I was going through some postpartum depression that was really severe for a, a, a couple of years there. And also I was just exhausted as so many parents will tell you and especially mothers, I was nursing my daughter, so I was exhausted. And I feel like sometimes I, I would find myself slipping into, and I was in my MFA program too, on top of all that, and teaching, so I was just, and writing novels. <laughs> so like, I was oh just gosh. doing so much. And so I would go into that kind of slippery place of memory and you know having some triggering of traumatic events from my past and just um, you know all these things that I was imagining in my stories. And there would be moments of kind of nightmarish, like not trusting yourself. You know, and as a mom, I found that was, was such a you know a crucial I issue that I had to trust myself to take care of my kids. I had to mother myself in order to mother my kids. And so that's Eva's journey. That's her discovery is learning to trust herself and her strength and who she is as a mom and a woman. Um, and so it was really fun to play with the genre of that unreliable narrator in a murder mystery because. I could get into a lot of these psychological issues that if I were just writing a memoir, for instance, I might be hesitant to talk about, you know, that I would, that we have sometimes these really dark thoughts and we, we uh, wonder like, who are we? Because especially as writers, when we get into all these different characters perspectives and we're learning about the psychology of, <laughs> of, you know, human psychology and sometimes abnormal psychology, we realize humans are capable of all kinds of stuff, you know? And, um, and so from the perspective of a mom who has children to take care of, a family to take care of, right? It was really interesting for me to get into that space of like, what is it, what would it mean right? If she is the villain and doesn't know it. I know. That was so yeah. good. It was so yeah, good. It was I fun. Loved it. You should totally try it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved it. You know, I mean, I appreciate like, you know, re having read it because I do feel like, you know, as a writer, you're always enjoying, enjoying reading a good book like yours, but then you're also kind of taking mental notes. <laughs> exactly. Like, how, how can I learn? You know, what can I learn from this? And I, I love one aspect that I loved about this uh, book is just that the the way you approached it with the unreliable narrator and then sort of the suspicions cast around some of the characters that are that naturally you want to like and you do like. I'm thinking about Jericho, her uh, uh, Eva's her husband. husband. You know, I never I never read a mystery. I mean, you know, I've read mysteries where you are suspecting different people and you're kind of like thinking, oh, could it be this person because of X, Y, and Z? Or maybe it's this person because of A, B, and C. But in this case, I found my, myself more like, I hope it's not this person. Please don't be that person. <laughs> don't be bad. Don't be that bad. You know, nobody's perfect. And that's another thing I love is that the characters are all very multidimensional. Right. They're, they're not like perfect, you know, people, but that's what makes it authentic. 
but that's also what makes you afraid that could it, could it be one of these people that you already like and root for? Could they be the ones that could have perpetrated some of these uh, terrible, you know, I guess, crimes, if you will? Yeah, because I took ideas and situations from my own family dynamic. And so, for instance, my husband, who is a, a black man, really was accused of a crime that the charge was later dropped. But that, you know, what that did to our relationship and how we had to overcome that and and grow and change together as a couple as well as individuals, you know, and and how that changed my point of view because I was coming at it, you know, originally as a woman who had been in an abusive relationship. And so I'm always like, always believe the woman, always believe the victim. But then what do you do if you have a false accusation, potentially in my own family, against a man of color, right? And so mm -hmm. it's like you're saying when justice, when when um, race and ethnicity comes into it and where there have been injustices, right? And so now you have to, you, you know, believe the woman, believe the victim, and also believe men of color too. And potentially it, it's, it's tricky. It's a like, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, but it was something that was so difficult in my own life that it was like, like I said, it was a psychic relief. It was a breath of fresh air to be able to give this to another family and, and have like the way that they worked it out, I feel like was a balm to my soul as a writer and as a woman, as a person, you know? And so it, I feel like, um, in some ways, writing is is like therapy <laughs> for me, you know. Yeah, so, no, I feel yeah. the same way. Yeah, it is, it is, and it is therapeutic. Um, and I mean, I also feel like, I, I mean, I, I think another common theme in the writing writing might be that when people read it, people from other walks of life, other perspectives, that hopefully they they might gain some empathy, like, like by exactly. these glimpses into these different lives these different worlds. And when I read that, um, you know, when I read the book and I, and, and I, and I thought about the dilemma um, that one, one that, that Jericho faced and that, that his, that Eva faced, I thought it was like just such an interesting, intimate glimpse into that feeling of almost hopelessness or that feeling of, oh no, I'm going to be suspected. And of course, everyone's going to think I am guilty or, or everyone's going to think my husband's guilty, even though I know that I'm not or that they're not, you know? Or you hope um, anyway. You never know. Yeah. You just never know for <laughs> sure. <laughs> it makes I you know. question everything. When someone, when an outsider comes into your family, right, it splits it open because then it's like everything that you trusted, everything you thought you knew was safe in your home. Right. And then it, you're questioning everything. And I felt that way about your novel, too, with Olvido and like that, that Solitario, you know, he had made this safe life for himself. And his dilemma is really, is he going to get involved? Right. Because like you said, he has this supernatural ability that he is able like and he's really the only one. Well, him and I'm sorry, my, my mind is so foggy. What is his partner's name? Uh, Onawa, the the, uh -huh, Onawa, Onawa, the Native that, American healer. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And they together are a able to right do what other investigators wouldn't have been able to do. Um, but he is so reluctant to get involved, you know. And so I was, I felt yeah. like I really felt his emotional dilemma as well. Um, and then one of the things that I loved about your book, and I wanted to ask you. A little bit about your experience in growing up in Texas. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the border. And so, just Texas. just like you know, in terms of the setting, how did you negotiate? You know, um, what the landscape was like when you grew up, and what the town was like where you grew up, and then you're writing about a place a hundred years ago, right? And so, what was that like? Researching and writing historical fiction, and then you know, blending together your own memories and you know, um, visual and sensory experiences with uh, an imagined past. Um, no, that's a good question, and, and I appreciate what you said. What you said about Solitario, you know, the, the part about his dilemma. I feel like it really ties to grief, you know, and like that's something that I think makes it very relevant. Just, you know, no matter the fact that it's set like back in 19, in the late eighteen eighties. Uh, but we humans, you know, we 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 lose and we and we grieve, 
And sometimes in grief, we, we find some comfort or safety, or we think we are finding that by isolating ourselves, like shutting ourselves down from, from the world, you know, because we don't want to really re-experience the, the grief or risk getting hurt again. And like, that's kind of what he, what he's afraid of. And since he can see spirits, um, I don't think I'll be giving too much away, but there's one reason he always stays out on his ranch. And it's that it's the one place where he can see the spirit of his departed wife, who he, you know, loves very much. Uh, mm -hmm. And so leaving there, it's almost like he can't bear leaving even for a moment. And back in those days, riding out, you know, on your horse and leaving the ranch and being gone for days to take on this job of investigating these crimes would mean just not being there to see the spirit and commune with the spirit of, of his wife. So to me though, you know, that's all symbolic of just ha um, a process of letting go and of having to heal from, from the wounds of grief, you know, um, and, and re engaging with the world. But at the same time you open up your heart, you're opening yourself up to being hurt again, obviously. Um, the, 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 you know, what you were asking about the border, um, yeah, you know, I grew up in, in a place called Brownsville, Texas and Matamoros, Mexico, which is the southern tip of Texas. So right where the Rio Grande flows out into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where I set my last novel, The, the Resurrection of Fulgencio Ramirez. Mm -hmm. um, and so for this novel, I kind of wanted to stay in that same world. And it's sort of a prequel, it's a standalone prequel to that novel. Um, but I wanted, since it was it had to be a Western, I thought, okay, it needs to be out in West Texas, you know, on the border, same border. And I was like, well, why would why would this why would this man leave if he's originally from that same land there, which in in the previous book I called La Frontera, a town called La Frontera? Um, why would he not be there anymore? And so I had to come up with his whole backstory is and, and because because of this curse that haunts the men in his family. Right. Uh, I figured the thing would be that he's trying to outrun the curse. He's trying to flee and he right. thinks, you know, maybe if he runs, gets away far enough, he can escape this curse. And at some point in the story, he he does think that he has eluded the curse when he settles <laughs> down and gets married in Olvido. But as right. we know, the past the past is very good at catching up with us. <laughs> yeah. So so that's that's kind of what happened there. But you know, West, the West Texas, fortunately, um, I live in San Antonio, Texas. And so uh, I have taken several trips out to West Texas with my family. And something is so evocative about the desert. I don't think I have to tell you because, um, you know, right. uh, you've set several of your uh, stories in deserts. <laughs> and, uh, and so. And actually, fact, my think, character goes to West Texas. So that was kind yeah. of funny, too. <laughs> yeah, part of her, part of her, part of her sleuthing and sort of uh, investigating yeah. leads her, and and also just personal life leads her to West Texas in your right. story. And and I know I remember so, uh, that your book also ends with some, you know, talk about the desert as well right. and about how strange things happen in the desert. And Absolutely. so yeah, the desert, the desert is this place where it feels like almost like magic could be more natural. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I love setting it, and it's kind of the desert is timeless, right? So even though it's like hundred plus years ago, it being in the desert, the desert doesn't change that much. Um, right, it still feels the same. Mm -hmm. The monsoons come, the winds come, it just sweeps it all clean, and it's just it looks the way it did always, like you said. So yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's kind of eerie and so, that. Yeah, the main thing that I drew from my own you know, upbringing experience for the creation of Olvido, which is like a mythical, a mythical town, was when I grew up on the border, the border was very much something that locals um, crossed back and forth, like right. almost on a daily basis. And so that I brought that sort of sensibility to Olvido, this idea that both sides of this river had been very kind of um, symbiotic and, and integrated. But when the river ships course, all that's left is this wound, this this scar between the two sides mm. of the town, with the dry riverbed. And um, yeah. I don't know. I found that that image to me was very haunting. Uh, the idea that this town was divided and the border was even more artificial and non-existent than it ever had exactly. been, and yet the town was still divided. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and I felt like so. you did it with with such wisdom and and empathy. And I didn't feel like the, I, I felt like the message was clear, but it didn't feel like you were preaching at all. It was just observations made from the people of the town and 
um, Solidario himself, and he was very wise, you know, even as he had so much to learn. I, just, I loved his character. Um, so I think he did a great job of that, like of bringing in the kind of Western cowboy, um, but he's also a Mexican man and um, he was a military man as well. Do you want to talk, yeah. you mentioned at all his military experiences, which are formative really to his relationships um, with his deputy and, uh, you know, and I feel like it was crucial to his character. But maybe he was like running away from something, right, by going into the military as well. Yeah, you know, being, he, he, I mean, this is another way that I think that his character pushes against the stereotype of Mexicans and Mexican Americans, like mm -hmm. in the Western genre, you know, usually those characters that were Mexican or Mexican American were either villains or they were just sidekicks, mm -hmm. comic relief, right. or they were like the town, the town drunk, you know, right. <laughs> someone that couldn't be counted on. Exactly. Um, in the case of Solitario, you know, he is sort of the ultimate charro, which is a Mexican horseman that is mm -hmm. all about his honor. Yeah. He wears that mm -hmm. he wears that amazing sombrero, you know, mm -hmm. the, the 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 suit that's embroidered, the black suit that's embroidered with the silver buckles down the seams of the pants, mm -hmm. you know. Uh it's a very um it's almost like a a version of the medieval knights of the of Europe, you know, but but in Mexico. Uh, this this very um, this very honorable sh you know chivalrous mm -hmm. type of warrior you know on a horse and um, and so I felt like that's the way that in Mexico charros are viewed um, and definitely not the way the Mexicans were viewed in the in the in the U S Western so I thought that was a great way to push back yeah. against uh, those stereotypes and establish. Um, you know, this hero where the sombrero is a symbol of pride and of honor, uh, as opposed to a symbol of, of being an outsider or, uh, you know, an outcast or something. Right. Um, and and yeah, he had... Difficult too. I mean, he even though he was, you know, like you said, chivalrous, but he wasn't that kind of machismo. He, he was, he respected people, all people. He respected women. He respected children. And the townspeople trusted him. Right. And and looked up to him. And so I felt like that was a part of his honor. I love I really love, I fell in love with him. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, you know, uh, I, I, I the previous novel, The Resurrection of Fulgencio Ramirez, the character of Fulgencio, his his biggest the way that that family curse manifested for him was his machismo. And his mm -hmm. machismo was sort of his biggest obstacle and his undoing and what he had to learn to overcome. And for Solidario, it's it's a little bit different. And I really kind of enjoyed playing with that, how the same curse might manifest differently in a different family member. He wasn't, yeah, he wasn't, a, 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 you know, a very macho kind of guy. Uh, he was very tender and, mm -hmm. and, and loving, I think, and, and just sort of honest and down to earth. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. that, I mean, I hope it comes across a little bit in his backstory, but he, he was an orphan and he was raised by his grandmother and his grandmother was very loving to him and nurturing to him. And so I think he just has a lot of respect for the women in his life. And, he, and he's also just very afraid of hurting them because of because of this curse, you know? And his grandmother is a curandera, right? Is that, would you describe her as a curandera? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah and, I would. Yeah, she's kind of a curandera, kind of a bruja, you know, a little bit of, a little uh -huh. bit of both. Right, exactly, a little bit of both, exactly. Yeah, I loved that and that he, he learned um, like the ways of the spirit and the earth and a respect for uh, spirit and earth right through his grandmother. So that was really beautiful. And I felt a little yeah. bit of like um, of Rudolfo Anaya's Bless Me Ultima. Were you influenced at all? I mean, I'm sure we, I feel like, yeah, like all kind of what you got right in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard not to. It's hard not to, you know, it's just a wonderful, uh, I mean, he was one of those, uh, wonderful voices, you know, from our culture that paved the way to help us be right. able to celebrate those aspects of our culture that I think oftentimes, even within our own heritage, were marginalized, you know, Absolutely. whether it was whether it was classism or, you know, I'm not sure exactly what, what it was, but um, I think that 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 I'm very grateful for that that past influence and for sure you know I'm influenced I'm influenced by him and um, I think I, that was one of the aspects that also fascinated me about 
your story was I wondered how you went about doing the research um, and, you know, for for the magic um, and, and the spells and the different herbs and the different mm -hmm. things you talked about. Like, I found it fascinating and I was curious uh, what insights you might share. Yeah, quite a bit of it was a personal investment. Sorry, my I don't know why my computer has gone very dark. So it's like atmospheric here. I <laughs> my my light is still on, but like it got really spooky in here. I don't know. I hope you all can still see me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's adding to the it's adding to the mood as we talk about magic. The <laughs> yeah. A lot of it was a personal investment and a personal interest in my culture, my cultural roots, and you know. So I was. I practice brujeria and curanderismo myself. Um, you know, not, not and not all of the elements of 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 all of the practices, but I take what is just like Eva. I've learned to take what is um, healing, nurturing to my soul, and then leave out other aspects. You know, that and, and I love that magic is so flexible like that. It's not, um, you know, th there's not the same kind of structure that there is in in a structured religion. So I grew up Catholic and I still practice a lot of my Catholic roots, but I love that I'm able to bring in elements of the um, indigenous ancestry as well and um, and bring that you know to my altar. So I might have, for instance, um, I have a, a card here of Tonantzin, which is um, an indigenous version or Mexica or Aztec version of the mother, um, mother Mary. Um, but then there's also like Tlatzol Teotol, who is a Mexica goddess and of divine love. And she's actually um, the eater of filth. And I loved that, that idea that she wow. takes in filth and, and purifies it. So anyway, it was just really a, an interest myself. And then I wanted to push back. So I, I love um, Bless Me Ultima, but I felt like, you know, he was paving the way absolutely for Mexican American and Mexican writers, um, but then perpetuating some of the stereotypes of brujas as you know malevolent and evildoers, um, and so I wanted to bring in a much more modern, much more um, you know a, a much more holistic way of looking at families and and women and you know anybody who practices um, the 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 rituals of our ancestors. So yeah, thank you yeah. for that. I think we might be at time to start. I realize I could just talk to you forever, <laughs> but I think yeah, this is to, fun. <laughs> to start I know asking I questions wanna... from the audience. Time, time to take questions from the audience. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So we sure. have a question here um, from Raúl Garza. asks Rudy, how much is your fictitious town of Olvido, Texas, inspired by your hometown of San Benito? My late dad was born there too. I think we oh, wow. answered that. Maybe you could go into that a little more. Yeah, that's awesome, Raul. Well, thank you for the question. And it's always great to meet somebody else from the Rio Grande Valley. So thanks for being here. Um, yeah, you know, I um, drew inspiration from, uh, actually, I was born and raised in Brownsville. San Benito's kind of like right right next to Brownsville. So really now, I think it's all just one big sprawl, you know, of, of, of development. But um in, in Brownsville, uh, we had two border crossings when I was a little kid, and my grandmother lived on the Mexican side. My maternal grandmother lived on the Mexican side of the, of the river. And for about seven years, uh, my family and I actually also lived over there to be close to my grandparents. So uh, we commuted back and forth um, every day. And I, so from, from I drew inspiration from that, uh, that upbringing experience of of growing up in a very binational, you know, um, setting where to me, the border felt, um, kind of artificial, even though, I mean, it was a river, but to me, it felt like one seamless community. And then of course, as one grows up and one starts to realize how that, how, how the divisions work out. Um, also it changed a lot, you know, um, over the last dec two decades, it changed a lot because of how the border just became more militarized and, you know, fenced and, crossing back and forth just became so much more time consuming and difficult. Um, and, and so almost like the border has become weaponized, you know? Um, yeah. And unfortunately used by a lot of people in a way that really hurts. Um, you know, I mean, I think it hurts all humankind, but I think it really hurts uh, obviously Latinos 
and Latino immigrants and refugees, like disproportionately. Um, but for me, yeah, I do a lot of inspiration from there. Um, you know, you, you alluded to it, uh, Jen, in terms of like setting it way back in the late 1880s, obviously it was, was uh, required a leap of imagination. And I did do research and looking at old photos of what border towns looked like back in those days, what people wore, you know, um, you know, how small the towns were, how did people get around, how long did it take to, to go from one place to another on a horse, you know, <laughs> instead of in an yep. airplane. So yep. that was really fascinating. Um, uh, but ultimately, you know, it's this small, dusty uh, border town, and that's kind of how I pictured my hometown probably was like in the late 1880s, except out in the desert, it'd be a lot drier, you know, and a lot more isolated and, and remote. But. Right. Oh, and I wanted to ask, too, I'm going to, there's a few more questions here I'm going to ask you, but what is your, did your son read the book, and what did he think? Did did you achieve what he wanted of your cowboy horror, <laughs> Western okay, horror? Okay, so he... he He's still working on it, and, and okay. this is the this is the tough part. He's a senior in high school, and okay. he's going through yeah. this his college application uh, <laughs> process. So yeah. you know, I I um, I think he has to prioritize that, and hopefully yeah, he'll get around to finishing. Are you proud my book. of you, yeah, for proud of you for yeah. writing it. <laughs> uh, very awesome. much so, very much so, yeah. And he, um, I mean, he knows the general idea of it, and I think he's very yeah. he's very excited about it. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, you know, another another thing that I know he liked that, that I love about the book, and I'll, I'll show it to you guys real quickly uh, here if I can, is that the book, uh, when you ask about the border town and kind of how I drew inspiration for that, I, I'm i a terrible artist, but I drew this very, like, you know, very I rudimentary loved map. That. I loved it. I didn't yeah. know you drew it yourself. That's cool. I, I, drew, I drew the original version, and then, you know, one of the artists at Blackstone, publishing our mutual publisher she yep. turned it into like these old right. antique looking uh, yep. maps and and so i thought that'd be cool because i thought since this is a make-believe town uh people might if they're reading the book they might start looking for it online and just not find it you know <laughs> <laughs> so i thought it'd yep. be cool if we had the maps to, uh, in the books and yep. they could kind of people could picture themselves there in the uh in this in this kind of mythical border town i did i kept finding myself going and well i'm i, I love you know, I'm a very visual person as well. So I've done, when, whenever I do research, I have to look at pictures and videos as, as I can. Um, and so I found myself going through the book and going back to the map and then, you know, and, and I love it too. Oh, when people awesome. put family trees and stuff like that. So I thought it was so cool that you added that. Thank you. Okay, I know I want to do a family tree next. <laughs> you absolutely should. Okay. Were there, speaking of family trees, were there any characters that grew or lessened in importance through subsequent subsequent drafts. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, um, you know, I think I think as as you know, as the story went through various drafts, one of the things that really evolved was the the depth and nuance of the relationship between Solitario, you know, the sheriff, and uh, and Onawa, uh, mm -hmm. his Native American, um, you know partner that, that is helping him solve solve this mystery um, at the beginning. I mean, there was always meant to be a little bit of a love interest, although mm -hmm. that was not the main attraction of the of, of book. But I think the more and more that I wrote the book and rewrote and edited, more depth started to come to their relationship and like more complexity. And so her character, I think, really almost maybe steals the show a little bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, because, yeah, because I just think she's I mean, he's kind of, he's, she's just very interesting. I, I think she's got a lot of potential as a character. And the more I wrote, you know, uh, and, and as I went through the editing process, the, the more her character grew and her voice grew. Mm, I love that. I love it as a writer. Uh, people ask, you know, how did you think of this? And I'm like, I don't know. The character just told me. Did you ever feel that, that she just had things to say as, and you didn't, weren't expecting? And as you would write, she, her voice just came through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's my favorite. That's probably one of my favorite parts about writing when the characters take over. Yeah. And I know some writers call it like being in the flow. And, and it's just like it's just the story's just coming to you. You're channeling it. The characters are doing what they are going to do and interacting the way they're going to interact based yeah. on their you know personalities and their dynamics. And it's almost like you're just sitting there watching a movie, but you're just like writing the script. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel like, you know, that's to me the the mark that you've really hit on the story that you have, like, you know, like you've created this world and now it's just organic and it's unfolding and it's that causal chain, right? And so when, when writers ask, like, how do you do that? How do you build a world? And it's like, you just set up all the pieces and then if you've done it right, it, they're going to naturally start, you know, interacting with each other in these ways because we make decisions based on the the choices in front of us. And so I don't always know what the characters are going to choose. They choose. And then I'm like, okay, now buckle up. We're in for a ride because they made a choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes those are difficult choices, you know, and then you're right. like, oh gosh, how do I write my way out of this one now? <laughs> <laughs> The fun part. I, I hardly ever know exactly what the ending's going to be. What about you? Did you know the ending, or was it a surprise to you as well? Don't give the um, ending. Away. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. Yeah. No, you know, I, I kind of, I didn't know exactly how it was going to end. I, I usually like to leave myself a lot of uh, room to for those types of spontaneous things to just sort of happen, and the characters sort of tell me where it's going to go, where the story's going to go. The only thing that was a little bit different for me with this book was that since it was, since it is a mystery, yep. there had to be a lot of planning. So you kind yep. of, uh, you know, I'm curious how you, how you felt about that, you know, to mm -hmm. have, to, you have to have a lot of planning because otherwise you're going to make a mess. Yep. <laughs> and the, oh, the mystery is not going to make sense. Yep. Right. So you kind of have to know sort of what's going on and then you the have plans to work really the throughout. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that was a fun challenge. Um, and that, so it did take more out, more detailed outlining and planning than I usually do. Um, but I still like to leave the ending open-ended because it motivates me to keep writing. If I kind of know what's going to happen 100%, I kind of lose a little bit of my motivation to keep writing. Right. <laughs> I feel that. I really feel that. I like to leave a lot of it open to spirit as well, you know, and just the idea of like, if I'm writing all of these worlds as magical worlds, in some way through magical realism, surrealism, you know, I want that to be an authentic part of the process as well. And so I definitely plan it, but I leave so much room open for just kind of the mysterious to take over as well. So I'm, I'm with you in that. It took a lot of meticulous planning. Think, I'm so thankful for my husband husband who will sit there and listen to me and go through plot holes with me for hours on end. Do you have someone that you go back and forth with a writing partner or is it like you're more just you and the page? Yeah. In this particular case, it was me and the page. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in some other ones, it is my wife. Uh, you know, my wife has been that person. So the previous novel, um, she, she, you know, I would I would finish a chapter and I'd have her like read it. You know, she yeah. probably was quite quite tired of that, and she could give me feedback and and she's very honest. So most of the stuff she loves it, but if there's something she's like, ah, that doesn't sound right, or that's not, I don't really feel like he or she would have really said or done that. You know, then I go back and I know I have to rewrite that. Um, that's so it's nice to have that. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to have that. In this particular book, it didn't it didn't go that way. It was really very much. Kind of like solitario you know just sort of working on it in my own little bubble of, of isolation uh during the pandemic even though my whole family was here in the house everyone was sort of doing their own thing yeah. the kids we were going to school pandemic. you know yeah i feel like in yeah. we were all in closed quarters like everybody needs their own project <laughs> so. yeah yeah so it was kind of uh it 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 you know it was a Actually, I don't know if I could have captured the feelings of isolation as as I did without having been feeling those feelings to such an extent, you know, during, during the process. Um, and then, and then, you know, like all of us have after the pandemic, I'm sure like, and are still working on it, like the whole process of re-engaging and building, com rebuilding community and friendships and those kind of things. A lot of that, I feel like, um, you know, um, I, I kind of wrote about it as, as I've been experiencing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like we answered Serena's question about how long did it take you to write your book? Well, we, maybe no. I think we still should say how long did it take you? And then are we more of a pantser or a planner? I feel like we both sort of said we're both a little bit. Well, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> you plan, I think so. you have to leave the spontaneous time too. <laughs> you do. I think the spontaneous is just 
for me, it's like what keeps it fun. You know, yeah. I want to be surprised and entertained too. If right. if I'm bored while I'm writing it, I'm pretty sure the reader's going to be bored. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, I is it Robert Frost? Someone says no surprise in the reader. I mean, in the writer, no surprise in the reader. So mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, that. and you know what? One thing I love about, and I don't know if you experienced this with writing, uh, magical realism, where some of your characters are still sort of come back, even though they've they've died in the earthly world. Yes. <laughs> uh, I yes. love that. I love that. I love writing in that style because sometimes, like I know, I won't give away which character, but when I was writing, one of my surprises was that one of the characters I meant to be alive for the whole story died. <laughs> he got he got killed, and I just was like kind of terrified. I was like, oh my gosh, I just killed one of my favorite characters. Now right. what am I gonna do? Which part, and I was like, oh yeah. Heartbreaking. I was I was not expecting that to happen, and I was like, no. <laughs> so I'm I very and grateful. I was like, oh, oh, that's hey, exactly. we have ghosts, we have ghosts in our story, so that's good. Yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I love it. There's so much freedom. I feel like with magical realism, you know, it's, yeah. it's refreshing, and and like again, it goes into the world of allegory, and so you're able to talk about these really sometimes heavy thematic issues, but in a way that still feels, you know, whimsical, magical, like in your book, I had it, even though there was, there was darkness, there was a real evil, right? Um, in the, in these murders and in the town, but I also through your storytelling, I felt the whimsy and I felt the, like, just this sense of like a, a, a lightness, a levity and, and a joy that permeated as well. So Thank you. There was some humor, you know, as yeah. I think we all need humor. Yeah. And then there there was, I think, a hopeful vision, you know, of like, yeah, we're dealing with difficult topics. Uh, same thing I saw in your writing, you know, there was darkness, but there was a lot of hope. Right. And that's what always I tried to get across is, you know, life on the border, life in life in America, the, the challenges we face um, to bring more um, you know, justice and, and, and more equity and more communion between diverse, um, you know, people like they, those are difficult challenges and there's a lot of suffering and pain. But I mean, we have to look for positive solutions. We have to find the good people, uh, you know, that people can collaborate with and, and build together and work towards a better community together. And I love that, that, that in the book, Solitario kind of finds that purpose in this town of Olvido that was pretty much dying. Uh, after the river shifted course, and he kind of finds this purpose in in helping to save this town and helping to heal this community. That's so beautifully said. I think we're at time. I wanted to ask you what you're working on now. Serena asked that question. Do we have time for that, or are we? Yeah, let's go ahead. What you both working on next? Yeah, you go first, Jen. <laughs> awesome. I'm working on a book. Actually, I moved to San Diego, and I'm right just over the over the mountains from where I grew up in the Imperial Valley on the Mexicali border. And I'm writing about the Salton Sea, which is, I'm writing a, it's a murder mystery novel, but I'm bringing in the very real issue of this Salton Sea is drying and as it dries, it's become toxic and it's threatening the entire community of the Imperial Valley where I grew up. And so it's a predominantly Mexican community. Um, many of the, the people who live there are living in, in poverty. So many people in the US have no idea that this ecological disaster, probably the largest in the entire um, country, is unfolding right before our eyes and so many people have no idea. So that is a, a social justice issue, um, an ecological issue, but I'm weaving it with magical realism and murder mystery. So people will read right. it. Right. <laughs> How are they gonna right. learn about it? Well, through a novel, of course. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. I mean, I love that it's kind of like an eco thriller, right? Yep. Uh, I love <laughs> yeah. I love I love weaving in, you know, climate related issues into these stories because so often, as we know, communities of color are, you know, just so disproportionately impacted right. by uh, pollution or, right. you know, climate change um, and, and so forth. And it was kind of an issue that in Valley of Shadows, I, I kind of trying to allude to as well, the, the issue of climate refugees, you know, how people are being pushed out of their homes or, or, you know, displaced because of things that change in the environment. And like, you know, that's what's happening in our world. Uh, it's happening, like you said, right before our eyes. Right. And what about you, Rudy? What are you working on now? Um, 
I have a couple different uh, things. Um, one is possibly a sequel to Valley of Shadows. Um, I, you know, when I created, built that world and created those characters, I did find it very hard to just sort of leave them behind. So they do kind of keep talking to me. <laughs> um, and, uh, I'm, you see those so, now. Yeah, so it's a possibility. And another one that I've been working on for a while that, that is really close to, you know, being ready is, I call it my border buildings Roman. Uh, but it's basically a coming of age uh, story set on the border, um, largely inspired, kind of semi autobiographical about my experiences growing up like in the 1980s um, mm. along the border. So awesome. one of those will be, I think, probably next. Yeah, that's awesome. I look forward. Great. And lastly, before we cut it out, because we are at that hour, where can people find you on social media so they can follow your progress and what you're working on? Oh, yeah. Jen, you go first. <laughs> yeah, I'm on all the social media. I'm going to just say Jen Givon. There's how you spell my name. I'm Jen Givon on Facebook and Instagram, and then switch it around. I'm Givon Jen on Twitter. So come hang out with us. <laughs> yeah, we. I, I'm only on um, Twitter, uh, and and you can look for me. Um, I, I'm, I posted it there, but it's Rudy underscore Ruiz underscore the number seven. So there's a lot of Rudy Ruizes out there. I was going to say. Uh, the only <laughs> You're <laughs> lucky number, number seven. seven. That's, that's, my lucky no that's my lucky number. Mine too. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it's a good well, one. Rudy, Jen, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations, Rudy, on Valley of Shadows. And Jen, congratulations on your up and coming uh, River Woman to River Demon, which we'll have again in store uh, that next week. Uh, don't forget, everyone, go ahead and get your own copy of Valley of Shadows. If you haven't yet, uh, click the link below and I'll take you to our website. All right. Without further ado, have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, good night. Thank you all. Thanks so Thank much. You. Have a good night.